Hello friends and welcome to my talk. I hope you have liked my previous videos and after this tremendous success of my previous videos, I have been receiving questions about this important topic about childhood incontinence, urinary incontinence in children. I, I hope you will find this talk very useful and I'm pretty sure that you have heard about this condition. Either your own children had this problem or any of your relatives had come across this distressing problem. This sounds very trivial, but it can be very distressing for the mothers, can be very distressing for the relatives, can be very distressing for the children itself if it persists beyond a certain age. Not only that, it can be also very difficult for physician to control this condition. So I am your, your friend in, in that regard and I'm going to talk you through the myths and facts about urinary incontinence in children. My name is Dr. Pramod Kumar Agrawal and I'm one of the physicians working in a busy hospital in Ireland. As I said, I've been asked by my followers and asked by a, my a friends to talk about this topic so that we can clear any doubts about this condition. If you have been through this condition or if you heard this condition from anybody, I think you should continue to watch this video. Now let's talk about urinary incontinence in children. What is urinary incontinence? It is basically a loss of bladder function leading to involuntary voiding. It is not something to worry about in children who, is, who are less than four years of age because most of the children will usually get daytime control of their bladder by age of four years of age. And usually by age of six, they will have control on nighttime bladder control. However, if it persists beyond that period, it is called bad waiting in common language or urinary incontinence or aneurysis. It is a very common problem and as I said it can be very distressing and challenging to manage. Now let's talk about numbers. It means how common is urinary incontinence in children. So it affects about 10 to 20 percent of boys between age group of 6 and 7 and there's a slightly less commoner in girls. So that is it, it affects between 8 to 17 percent between age group of 6 and 7 in girls. So if you look at, if you subdivide them when the child wets, is it daytime or nighttime or both time, you will wonder which type or when is the urinary incontinence is more common. Is it daytime, nighttime or both? And I'm pretty sure you will be confidently can say that the urinary incontinence or bad wetting will be more commoner at the night time than in daytime. So if in that age group between six to seven, about two thirds of children will have nighttime incontinence problem. However, about 10% will, will have an isolated daytime incontinence problem. And about 16% will have incontinence in the daytime and nighttime. However, if we talk isolated numbers, that is up to 20% of boys will have urinary incontinence by age of seven. But should we be worried about that? No, not really. It's because each year about 15% of children get cured from urinary incontinence without doing anything. By the age of 10 or 11, only 2% of children will be left who will have problem with bad wording. So this is very important, especially for parents that please don't stigmatize it. If child has urinary incontinence, it's not their problem. It's nobody's fault. It's just the way body is and every child is different. So we should not generalize, we should not stigmatize, we should not make it a big taboo for the child and causing them more distress. So as we said that the nighttime incontinence is very common. Let's talk about why that is so. So incontinence is a very complex pathway and it's mostly due to the sleep, sleep awake cycle. So there are two main pathways which are recognized to cause nighttime 
incontinence. One is there is a hormone which is secreted from the brain called vasopressin. And the role of vasopressin is to preserve water. So there is less water in the bladder and there is less urine output. However, it, is, it has been found that that hormone is less secreted at the night time. So there is more urine formed and there is a possibility that the child would have incontinence. And second, second pathway is that the storage capacity of bladder is reduced at the night time. So combined with low chemical from the brain called vasopressin and lower bladder capacity, there is a more chance of urinary incontinence at the night time. And also there is a pathway called arousal pathway. And it has been found that the children who has urinary incontinence, they have a higher threshold to awake and leading to incontinence. So they, 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 the stimulus from the bladder is there, but they are, they are what we call a deep sleepers. So they sleep a lot and they don't realize that bladder is full. They don't awake and then they wet at the night time. So let's look at type of urinary incontinence or aneurysis. I subdivided them into three broad categories. One is depending on the time of the day. Is it at the night time or daytime? Secondly, is it the only problem depending on other associated symptoms or not? And if the child has only incontinence is the main problem, then it is called monosymptomatic aneurysis. Or if the child has other associated symptoms, for example, urgency or pain passing urine, it is called non-monosymptomatic aneurysis. And thirdly, was the child ever dry? So if the child was never been dry, it's called primary urinary incontinence. Or if the child has a period of dryness of up to six months, and then started to have wet wetting, it is called secondary incontinence. So now, so far we know that what is urinary incontinence, what is, how common it is, and what are the different type of urinary incontinence, and why urinary incontinence is most common at the night time. Let's talk about the management. You must be wondering that everybody who has urinary incontinence should get treated, should get a medication. We should highlight it. We should find out is there a problem or not. No, that's not true. As I said earlier, that although up to 20% can have urinary incontinence at age of six or seven, but 15% each year will resolve. So we should not be medicalizing the child or should not be distressing the child. So to manage urinary incontinence, one thing is very important that usually there is no treatment is recommended for a child below age of seven years of age. So please, please, please do not get worried or anxious if child is having urinary incontinence and they are, have, are, they are seven years or younger. They might have siblings who, who achieve dryness in a younger age, but please do not worry if they are below seven years of age because eventually they will come out of it by their own. However, sometimes they might need some treatment if they are going on a party, if they're going on a picnic. So you have to talk to your healthcare provider regarding that. However, there's nothing to worry. It's normal, it's normal development and child has no consequences of that. To, to manage urinary incontinence beyond that, it is very important to understand or outrule any underlying cause. So for example, is there constipation? Constipation is very common. There's a, if there's a full bum or full rectum that will put pressure on the bladder and bladder will get smaller and the capacity will be lesser. Child has kidney infection. They have infections in the water works. It can irritate the bladder and there could be urinary incontinence. Sometimes anxiety or stress can lead to urinary incontinence and it is more common for the daytime incontinence. Diabetes and un undiagnosed diabetes can lead to urinary incontinence because if there is sugar in the urine, it attracts water out 
and the bladder fills quicker. And child who is a deep sleeper or who has a small bladder capacity, they will have urinary incontinence in that family. So, first management. So there are a few few steps to tackle urinary incontinence, and I, I followed the National Institute of Clinical Excellence guidelines, and which are very good and very practical. So they gave us basically a strap wise approach to tackle urinary incontinence. And it not necessarily had to be done by a physician. It can be done at home. It can be done uh, in, in conjunction with your family practitioner or, or general practitioners. And in that case, if that doesn't improve, you can, you can escalate it to incontinence nurse or eventually then they need a specialist referral. So the first management is what we call is, is fluid intake rationalization. So that means that the child has to take age appropriate fluid in the day. And again, it is recommended that not to take any, any soft drinks at the late in the evening or drink tea and coffee in the evening. And you can, you can easily find in the link below my presentation, the, the amount of fluid a child is allowed. So this is a part of what we call a non-pharmacological treatment. So non-pharmacological treatment, one is fluid rationalization. Second is what we call positive reinforcement system or a reward system. And third is bad wetting allowance. So now second, let's talk about the second one, which is positive reinforcement or reward system. So it's very simple and it's very effective. So child keeps a diary and gets a sticker for each dry night. And at the end of a specific number of nights, the child gets a reward. For example, you decided to the child, if you have seven dry nights, you, I will buy you a toy or you, you can, you can and do anything nice with the child. It is not for a specific day, it's, it's for a specific amount of tasks. So that's very important. And eventually brain will have a positive reinforcement and child will eventually have a dry night. And third is a bad wetting alarm. I have again I have put a picture down there in my link and it's basically a very simple alarm with senses and your wetness in the underpant and it gives you a vibration and a noise and child wakes up and goes to the loo and empties the bladder. So this way eventually the child learns to control their bladder or wakes up a certain stimulus and eventually have dry nights. One thing is very important does this urinary incontinence or bad alarm are not recommended for child below five years of age or not recommended for for children who have intellectual disability of their siblings and who have intellectual disability so let's talk about the second line of treatment again and it's now if those measures have failed there are very safe and effective medications so one medication is called desmopressin and you might recall this name it's a hormone which is reduced at the night time. So basically what you do is you give the child a tablet before going to bed and it does exactly the same as it should do normally. So it will retain water and there will be less urine production and child will have dry nights and eventually child will come out of, of the urine incontinence in the normal pathway. And what, what it has been found by research that if you combine the tablet desmopressin with bad alarm, they are very effective in the short term and eventually in the long term. And in the subsequent minutes, I'll be talking about which is the best method in short term gain and which is the best method for lowest rate of relapse. So please continue to watch as you will find this talk, uh, the subsequent um, information very useful. And there are, there are other medications which can be used for what we call anticholinergic medications, which increases the tone of the bladder. And the examples are oxybutynin or tolteridone. And there are some medications which have been used classically as, as antidepressants. And they are also very good. However, those medications should be prescribed only by specialists who have experience in those tablets. So, now that we know what is urinary incontinence, what are the cause of urinary incontinence, and how would you manage, so non-pharmacological management and pharmacological management. 
Now let's talk about how would you gauge response. So, the, so it is found that there could be a full response or there could be a partial response. So full response is that if the child has 14 consecutive dry nights, and that is, or they have a 90% improvement in the weekly incontinence, that is a full response. A partial response if there is less than 14 dry nights or less than 90% improvement. And obviously no response is another possibility, but usually a child will show some response if you try those methods. So the magic number here is, is 14 days or 90% improvement. You would be wondering like which is the best method for short term gain. And again, I have put a link in below and you can have a visual uh, presentation. This is, this is what it shows is which method is most effective in achieving full response. So anything, any line which are right side of the median line is good and anything which crosses the line or which are on the left side are not good. So you would see that alarm is very good, bad wetting training is very good and tab tablet desmopressin is very good. And if you talk of the pharmacological management, the desmopressin combined with alarm and desmopressin combined with oxybutynin are very effective. So those you understand are very good in, in achieving a full response. However, it doesn't mean that they will have a persistent effect. So the most effective method to have a persistent effect is alarm because it, it gives you good response and it, it, the effect remains for a longer period. And other method would be that the, the reward system is, is very good. So I hope it's clear so far and you understand what urinary incontinence is, what are the different type of urinary incontinence and how you could manage urinary incontinence at home or with conjunction with your primary care provider or if needed and specialist input. So I would like to summarize here, there are three main points. One, urinary incontinence is unfortunately is a common childhood problem. However, reassurance is very important and not distressing child is very important. And please bear in mind that do not panic or do not stigmatize the child if they are below seven years of age. And thirdly, you need a complex care pathway and it is, which constant input from the child, constant input from the parents and the relatives and constant input from the child care provider. So thank you for listening and I will see you in the next video. Please do not hesitate to leave a comment in the box below and please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button. Thank you.